Hey everybody, welcome to the show. I've, I'm walking on a, a tightrope a little bit higher than I usually am most nights, and I'll tell you why. Last night, of course, you know that technical difficulty that happened. Well, I think that it's time for me to finally update some video encoders over here. Maybe that's it. And I, I, I was hesitant to do so because it was going to leave a few of the plugins that I really enjoy using outdated and, and not compliant anymore. But I don't know what else the hell could have been causing that complete shutdown. And in the meantime, and as a result of that, that big freeze up last night, what happened was the only place that you can find the full episode is on YouTube because YouTube, unlike everywhere else, when everything, whenever something cuts off, uh, you can resume where it got cut off until you actually physically end the broadcast, which was very great because then everybody got to have a full podcast episode and you can watch it on YouTube, whereas you can't get that anywhere else just for last night. So if something happens tonight, which I'm praying to God it doesn't, um, at least I have that to fall back on, but I want it to be a smooth one because we got a great guest on. We've got some really nice topics, and I want to do some experimenting. Now, I want to do a little bit of experimenting. What is that experimenting? Well, I'm going to try to take some calls with the guest on. Her name is Rachel Wilson. I'm going to get into her backstory a little bit in just a, just a tad. But um, here's the thing. Just when we get there, if anybody in the audience had any questions for her, because we're going to be talking about feminism. We're going to be talking about the occult roots of feminism, witchcraft, the CIA, everything. And we're going to go through all of the waves themselves. You know that the old thing that we, you know, a lot of people are a little bit more content saying these days. Well, second and third wave feminism went off the rails, but those suffragettes, they really had a point. What was behind the suffragettes? Well, we're finally going to be able to talk a little bit about that tonight, and Rachel Wilson is the person to do it with. So what I was thinking was, because this is a topic that's going to inspire a lot of questions, especially from maybe some of the women in the uh, in the audience, I'm sure that there's no question or challenge that Rachel has not heard, I wanted to so desperately get a, uh, you know, open up a line that can get through to Rachel. And right now skype doesn't provide it skype does not hear the system sounds from zoom so they can hear it back but zoom can hear things that come in through skype okay same thing happens with the gilded too there's just always a block there's no cross-platform uh you know functionality and zoom is for some reason doesn't allow you to add phone calls to meetings or add multiple call anyway so what I'm going to do tonight is it's a little it's a little bit crude, but it'll do the trick. If you want to pose a question to Rachel at any point, I'm going to be opening up the hotline. Okay, that is the that is the occult feminism hotline where you can ask our our uh, guest a question. Is this it right here? Yeah, that this is what it's going to be. It's the nine one four three six nine one two three six number. Now, toward the end of our discussion, if we have some time, I really would like to take a call. And you can pose your question and hang up because you're not going to hear the answer unless you're listening to the stream. That's the only, you know, we're getting there. It's one of those things that I really want to figure out because it's so important to start taking calls from the audience while a guest is on to be able to challenge certain points or ask questions or whatever. I think that is just the, the logical next step. So you can consider this a voicemail 
question. And we had some ideas about actually incorporating voicemail into the show as well. So we'll see how that goes. But for tonight, maybe one or two you call in and you can be part of history. And if not, I think that the discussion I have with Rachel is going to be far, um, you know, far beyond sufficient. And I'll be looking at your emails and taking your calls afterwards. In the second half, you're not going to want to miss that because I went and I dig, I digged up or dug up, digged up. I dug up a, um, I dug up a old article that I've had for years. Well, it's a translation. It's the transcribing of an old article from 1924 from Nikola Tesla, who described in this, in this newspaper, why he believed he would never marry. And you got to hear the things he had to say from 1924. That'll all be here tonight on this Thursday evening, October 19th, 2023, where we have Rachel Wilson, author of Occult Feminism, The Secret History of Women's Liberation, on with us. Uh, tomorrow will be fine. Got Matt in, I'm pretty sure. Next week we'll be chilling. Jay Myers documentaries, he'll be on. Not, not Jay Dyer, Jay Myers. Though Jay Dyer does not have a... Uh, is not too far removed from tonight's show because it was with Jay Dyer that I heard Rachel Wilson speak for the first time and it, it just it was sensational. Of course Jay's a great host and that was on InfoWars. I heard it on Talk the Talk Stream app and so I got in touch with her and it's great. Um what else? Greg Carlwood next week. We're getting to real creepy stuff next week. Creepy small town travel stories next week. We'll be doing those call-ins with you guys. We have a lot already in our thread that is up on the forum on quitefrankly.tv. Saturday, October 28th, I'm hoping to do a Saturday night special. And on that special, I'm hoping to carve a pumpkin in here. Hopefully I don't slice my entire hand open. But I'm pretty decent with pumpkin carving. I'm not like... I mean, it's like a basic, put a face on it. Don't expect anything spectacular. Um, and there you have, almost at the end of Halloween season. All right, let's go into the grab bag. First thing is first. Here we go up. Oh, now, I had to bring this up because last night we did discuss a little bit about the whole idea about clones and whether or not that is something that you could apply to Joe Biden, who, you know, anybody else who has their, you know, cognitive function there, you can say, oh, that's a that's a double, that's a double, because, you know, you just run the script, but there's just such a... So it's, I don't know. Anyway, they the Internet turned their attention to Nancy Pelosi. And, of course, Biden, Pelosi, this is what Isaac's army, I think it's a uh, some kind of a... A, uh, a tribute Twitter to Isaac Cappy. Take a look at this. Since we were talking about masks and all that last night, Nancy Pelosi's face is being examined. That's not Nancy Pelosi. Hold on a second. Boom. Sorry to scare you. Nancy Pelosi's face is being examined. Now they're going, they, they're zooming in on the eyes. And this, you know, I, I don't know. And, it, and it, the, the quicker or the closer you get in there, the scarier it gets. I saw this in bed last night. I still had a couple more minutes left of energy in my eyes, and I was just like, okay. I'm listening to some talk radio. I'm scrolling through, and I saw that. I went, oh, God. Oh, please don't creep into my dreams. Please don't. Because even if it's just her regular eyes, it's weird. But if this really is somebody wearing a mask, then I'm just, that is just so deranged and so diabolical. It's unbelievable. But they're saying that this was a person wearing a mask. Do you think it is? I don't know. I don't know. She's another one that's just in her 80s. I mean, you just sink, you shrink and sink back and your eyes retreat and everything. I don't know. Perhaps. Perhaps. I won't rule it out. I mean, you remember we had, um, what's his name on? Um, our buddy, uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Peterson. When he came on to talk about the Arizona Mafia, one of the episodes that he came on to talk about was a little bit related to cloning, and he actually mentioned being in a plane or a like a like a business setting with Nancy Pelosi, and they were thumbing through like almost like a picture book, and um, 
and he said uh, he heard her overheard her say something to the effect of, "Oh, that that yeah, he's really good. He's he's doing mine, as in he's doing my clone." Now, whether or not whether she's talking about somebody who's cloning her body, and then she's going to be. Uh, her soul is going to be transplanted into it like Chucky or something like that. Or if she's talking about, oh, yeah, he's cloning my dog. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. And if you were going to start cloning, why would you have yourself cloned at age 70-something and put yourself into yet another 70-year-old body? If that is even whatever ritual makes that happen. I mean, if just put me into a baby again or put me into a a 12-year-old version of myself. Don't put me back into me at 70-something. Please. Please. Anyway, so I wanted to bring that up because I thought you all would really appreciate it. Uh, here's the next thing. JFK, oh, JFK, RFK. RFK Jr. comes out in favor of reparations, carving a lane to Biden's left. Now, this is what I'm seeing here. Um, mask off of RFK too. You know, like we've said before, solid on free speech, solid on big pharma, but retarded on everything else. But this d- does this mean that he's probably more inclined to take votes away from Biden than Trump? Now, some say that this is actually aimed at taking from Trump, since more black voters are switching over to him. But if they are switching over to him in the first place, is reparations really something that drives their thinking? Is that really something they're hung up on? Or, or, are, they, or are they looking for anybody to just unburden them from what is going on in the country and, and, and allowing everybody to be a little bit, create a little bit more wealth for themselves instead of constantly needing to be taken care of? I don't know. If, if, that, if, if that is RFK's presumption, that this would stem the tide of people that are retreating away from the Democrat Party and going to Trump, that reparations is going to be something that that calls them over to him, then I think that presumption is pretty insulting. So, one way or another, this was weird. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. supports using reparations to the black community, making him the most prominent 2024 candidate to favor the controversial policy meant to, uh, to alone... Uh, to atone, I'm sorry, to atone for slavery and legal segregation. Yeah, no, th- yeah, that'll that that'll quench the thirst. That'll quench it all, I'm sure. Anywho, let's see here. Oh, I heard that uh, Britney Spears is playing with knives again. She's got a book coming out, and boy, oh boy, she's like juggling knives. What's going on? What's happening? Here's a waste of time. This is from live, LiveScience.com. Mark Swan sent this to me the other night. Ultra-powerful plasma blades could slice entire stars in half, new paper suggests. Stars could be sliced in half by relativistic blades or ultra-powerful outflows of plasma shaped by extremely strong magnetic fields and unpublished paper claims. Now, is this something? We'll see. Uh, let's see here. And these star splitting blades could explain some of the brightest explosions in the universe. Oh, okay. So this is not a man-made blade. I was saying to myself when he sent it to me, I said, you know, if this is what everybody's dealing with, the world in the, in the shape that it is, and there are people that are trying to figure out how they can cut stars in half, I'd believe it. I'd believe that we'd have that much, uh, planetary ADHD. The study authors based in the center, uh, based at the Center for Cosmology and Particle Physics at New York University outlined the results in a paper published in September to preprint database, um, Ar- Arxiv. The study has not yet been peer-reviewed. Researchers were hunting for the origins of certain types of gamma-ray bursts. Gamma-ray bursts are some of the most powerful explosions in the sky, but they typically occur so far away we can only see them as brief but intense blips of excess gamma-ray radiation. Only a handful of known objects can generate energies required to power a GRB, and so most astrophysicists assume that either black holes or magnetars, is that like a dinosaur? Giant robot? A magnetar. Oh my gosh. That black holes or magnetars are involved. 
likely when they are engaged in something violent like ripping a star apart. However, astronomers have struggled to explain why some gamma ray bursts fade away very slowly. Well, in this new study, the author suggests that these lingering GRBs may occur when some massive stars die. The core of the star collapses, forming the neutron star, which is a city-sized ball of ultra-dense neutrons surrounded by heavy layers of hydrogen and helium. That neutron star can acquire an extremely strong magnetic field through rapid compression and rotation. This turns the neutron star into a magnetar. That's what it is. Which hosts the most powerful magnetic fields in the known universe. But the authors of the new study realize that the magnetar's magnetic fields can only beam intense bursts of radiation along the magnetar's equator, shaped by the extreme centrifugal forces, centrifugal forces of the rotating star, these beams of radiation form a blade that moves outward through the star at nearly the speed of light, carrying more energy than a supernova explosion. So what this will turn into now is a study as to how the blade can be used to, uh, in, to create a, a new weapon of war over here on Earth. Do, do they call it a blade? This relativistic blade can perfectly bisect the star. Can we put a hilt on it? Can I swing this blade? Slicing it in half on its way out, the study authors found. Well, see, there's a lot more going on outside of your backyard. Outside of your... I know it's, the, it's grub season. I know you probably have those early morning skunks digging through your front yard looking for all those grubs. Put the grub killer down. That's all that matters to me right now. You can keep your relativistic blades. All right, let's get this show on the road because very soon we're going to have a very special visitor and I cannot wait to talk with Rachel Wilson. Don't go anywhere. Help me share the show far and wide. I tweeted it out and uh, I forgot to share it anywhere else. So wherever you're watching right now, hit that share button and uh, give me a hand, will you? All right, we'll be right, right back. Really have a right to be treated respectfully. We are well, unfortunately well, running out of time, but Peter, I just want to get one final thought from you. Are there words that are used to describe men that offend you? Uh, not particularly, and, and if, if there are some I don't like, I certainly wouldn't want them banned. But it go, you know, it always goes back to that old adage: sticks and stones may break my bones, but there will always be some things to offend a feminist. Peter Lloyd, well, that, no, that's just obnoxious. Peter Lloyd, you have to be careful. That is ridiculous. That, no, hang on, I won't do your show again if you don't let me respond. Okay, have a word. Come on, that's ridiculous. I mean, first of all, that, like, first of all, to allow. You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's run! My conscience better It's witchcraft All right And I've got no defense for it The heat is too intense for it Yes What, what good, good would common sense for it do? Ah it's, it's witchcraft All around us our government is controlled by witches and warlock bastards. 
How are you tonight? I hope you're doing well. It is Thursday. I'm feeling comfy. I'm feeling pretty cozy. And we got a good guest coming on. So welcome. Welcome. Now, if you have been following this show for any extended period of time, then you know that a funny thing tends to happen seemingly on its own. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of foresight. There's a little bit of vision involved. But a lot of times, you just set something in motion, and it just magnetizes, especially if you create it with the right energy. It's magnetized. It's a little bit of witchcraft. So you know that show topics and guests, they almost just, they almost start magically magically leading into one another and building on each other. The themes, the things that we talk about, they start building on each other. And in the beginning of this week, we discussed rising depression rates. We talked about prescription drug consumption, suicide that is going up across most demographics in secular Western society. Uh, Multiple nations are seeing increased spikes that are really concerning. And in the beginning, I mean, we, we asked this question, how could this be? You know, how could this be, especially during a time when people, especially girls and women, women and girls, are shedding the supposed shackles of the oppressive old world and taking quantum leaps into an age of unprecedented liberation and and empowerment? How can this all be? Why is it that everyone is feeling worse than they were a few generations ago, but especially girls? Well, tonight's guest is uh, she's going to be a very interesting person to ask that question and have other uh, conversations with. Rachel Wilson is a wife and mother of five children. She's a homeschooling advocate who lives in the rural Midwest, Orthodox Christian. When she is not attending to her duties, to her family and church, she's enjoying fitness and cooking and researching history and studying philosophy and religion and publishing books. She's also a licensed firearm instructor who specializes in home, in home defense and concealed carry instruction. But her latest published book, Occult Feminism, The Secret History of Women's Liberation, is available on Amazon now. And uh, I heard her for the first time, like I said, with our friend Jay Dyer on InfoWars. And I said, man, she would be a great person to call a friend as well. So here she is, Rachel Wilson. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing I'm doing great. It's great to have you on. And, you know, um, you've been once I found you, I realized just how much work you've been doing, not only, you know, hanging out with people like Jay, but you were on Tucker Carlson and you really you kick a lot of ass. I got to give you credit. (laughs) Well, thank you. I'm actually I've been a big fan of your show for a few years now, so I'm super happy we got a chance to connect and I'm I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, great. I know a lot of people are thrilled that you're here. And, you know, um, I ordered your book. It, It should be in later this week, though, so I didn't have time to sift through it, but I have so many you know, questions just in my head already. We have plenty to go on, but I would love to first know a little bit about your life leading up to the undertaking of the book because, oh, well, I guess I should just say, is your life story one that is consistent with your upbringing or is your life story one of conversion? Or did you, did you, you grow into what you have today? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So I was born to um, two parents who I feel like are kind of boomer poster parents. Um, I had my radical Marxist feminist mother and then my like Rush Limbaugh neocon dad. Wow. Uh, How did yeah. that, said, are they still together? No, to the <laughs> surprise of nobody, it did not last. Uh, so they, they divorced when I was a kid and it really threw, you know, life into a tailspin for my sister and I. Um, And it was weird growing up with like these two completely opposing worldviews and hearing like my mom's view of the world and then my dad's view of the world and then trying to figure out, you know, when I became an adult where I was going to go with things. And um, I didn't I wasn't super political until I had my first daughter right before that big nine event uh, that happened in 2001 Mm. and really started having, you know, to think about things deeper. And um, I also... (laughs) When I had to drop my daughter off at daycare to go back to work, I remember driving there thinking, this is the stupidest, most inefficient, ridiculous system. Why are we all doing it this way? Why am I dropping her off to get raised by some other woman while I go to a job I really don't care about now that I've had a child and pay about half of what I make for someone else to do what I want to do, which is raise my own daughter. And I would voice these 
these questions to the women around me and they would it was like talking to a bunch of automatons who were just like this is what we do now this is how things are now you'll get used to it the baby will get used to it and I was like I don't want to get used to it this sucks you know Mm. um so it really started to make me think and um question things and I'm a bit of a history nerd so I started even back then you know, digging into little bits of history about things like feminism, because my mother was so into it. She was like an activist. She was an Obama, you know, um, you know, out knocking on doors and doing phone banks for Obama. She volunteered for Planned Parenthood. And um, she was an atheist and I was Christian. I followed my dad into Christianity as a kid, but I wasn't like super serious about it when I was young. So yeah, I just had to really think about, you know, like, what do I want to do and how do I defend these choices? So when I decided I wanted to stay home and be a mom, everyone around me, even the conservative Christian moms around me, fear mongered me to death about Mm. staying home with my kids. You're not going to have your own money. What if your husband leaves you? What if he abuses you? It's you're going to be too vulnerable. It's too risky. You shouldn't do it. And I just thought, nobody would be scaring me this way if I was taking a career path, right? They wouldn't say, you know, if I was going to be a surgeon, they wouldn't say, what if you get in an accident and you can't do surgery? What if you get arthritis and and you can't be a surgeon anymore? What then, you know? You can't hold a scalpel. Yeah, exactly. So I just got kind of used to having to defend my radical ideas about raising my children myself, (laughs) even to people around me who were supposed to be like, family oriented conservatives. And so it really made me think, how did we get here? I'm really interested in the genesis of ideas, where people get their belief systems from and things like that. So that's kind of how over the course of many years, I just looked more and more. And the more things I found, the more interested I was and just kept kind of digging in. And, um, you know, my kids are much older now. I only have two left at home and they're already in their teens. So my husband was like, you know, now that you have more time, you should probably do something with all of this because you know so much about it and and you're good at arguing it and like it would probably be really useful to people. Like what about the other moms that want to stay home? And I thought about my four daughters and and what life would be like for them in, in another 20 or 30 years of this madness. So. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, this, this, this what, what you just brought us along for, I think it's just so relatable um, because there's, there's also a the, the male side of this, too um to this is just when you talk about oh this is the way it is now you'll get used to it uh, that is that's something that everybody has been groomed into accepting uh yeah. for for many ways i mean you know there is a Whereas, whereas you guys, uh, whereas women, I believe many, many times have been uh, forced away from following their their inner desires to actually go and do that with their lives because it's not it's retrograde or it's oppressive or something like that. They feel like they they have to ignore what nature is telling them to do. On the other hand, men are being told to step back and stay out of their way and don't interfere or or voice your own opinions about what you what you would like to see um and you know oh and i'm glad you all already you've already brought up the whole idea that we'll, we'll get to it that there is definitely <laughs> a feminism problem in in the right wing and i can see how it happened but it it's just like it's all over the place now as far as women's liberation goes because now here comes into your studying yeah. um i came up like many other people uh, being taught that it was just in a an organic idea whose time had finally come after thousands of years, and we have now in the modern day become vastly more equal, vastly more happy and contented society because of it. But I, I gotta say, as I said in the opening, when you dip into the reality of things statistically outside of what you know, uh, Cosmopolitan Magazine is saying, uh, divorce, depression, despondency, childlessness for a number of reasons. Uh, men aren't doing well. Children aren't doing better. And, and women, women are, women are not doing well despite being the recipient of these newfangled privileges in society. Why, why is that? Where do we start with unpacking women's liberation? I think the first thing I would love for people to understand is that the history most people think they know is not true. (laughs) It was literally uh, rewritten by uh, gender studies and women's studies departments, which were created, funded entirely by the Ford and Rockefeller foundations in the late 60s, early 70s. And what they did was 
they rewrote the history using something called standpoint theory. Standpoint theory was developed by a radical Marxist feminist who uh, Nelson Rockefeller was a big fan of. Um, her name was Sandra Harding, and she said, look, the history you know, that you all think you're operating off of, uh, you think you have this objective timeline of events, but really when you think about it from a Marxist perspective, there's no such thing, right? It, it, history looks different from the standpoint of the oppressed, and the more oppressed you are, the more standpoints you have, therefore the more accurate your interpretation of history will be. So we have to completely rewrite the history of the feminist movement from the perspective of the oppressed woman. Now, why did she say this? Well, the reason she said this is because people may not know the ver the vast majority of women in the West. Now we're just kind of sticking to the West. We can't like get into China and different places of the world because that would take us all day. But in the West, the vast majority of women were completely against suffrage. Mm -hmm. They were against women's liberation. They did not want it. In fact, the suffragists were the ones who blocked women's referendums on voting. So they did a couple of preliminary referendums in like Massachusetts, a um, couple other states in the United States, and only about 4% of women voted in the referendums that they even wanted a women's voting initiative to be on a ballot. It was vastly unpopular. Um, and the reason the anti-suffrage women gave for this, they had lots of great reasons, but they said, look, we have a lot of privileges and protections that we've gained under men's suffrage that we don't want to lose. We feel like we have a politically neutral moral high ground because we are not a voting bloc. We don't have lobbyists. So therefore, when we do ask politicians for something we're more likely to get it we're more likely to be listened to mm. and and we don't want the destruction of the family we don't want um the destruction of motherhood and things that they could see coming in fact there was much higher membership among anti-suffrage groups among women than there were pro-suffrage groups you would never know that the way that they tell the history now they act like every woman wanted it like it was extremely popular and the men just could no longer ignore it uh totally untrue so they literally rewrote history and what the common idea is for most people if you just did a man on the street is that uh life for women prior to 1920 was horrible slavery it was drudgery it was torture it was oppression women couldn't read they couldn't it was sharia law they couldn't leave the house or get an education and it's shocking when you actually go back and do some digging you look at some laws you look at writings of even feminists from the 19th century this was not the case at all in fact susan b anthony complained in volume one of her history of women's suffrage that they had a terrible time getting women on board with the suffrage movement because they already had everything they wanted she said they're too content um they graduated more high school than men did is going back to the 1790s in this country women had more elementary education than men did it's true that women didn't get into uh you know higher education very much early on but also neither did the men back then college was supposed to be for like the top few percentile of like really smart people generally men mm -hmm. because the men were the ones who had to provide and protect and and women generally did want to be mothers they they didn't have like these ceo boss babe aspirations really so much so susan b anthony herself said man it was really tough because the women are so like content with their lives we kind of had to snap them out of it and convince them that they were oppressed because they just didn't believe it uh now you could say and i've had this objection thrown at me like oh well they just never knew anything other than servitude so you know they were scared of liberation it's actually not true women had a lot of freedom and privilege in the west even before suffrage uh, but it was still kind of under the guise of women being mothers and you know nurturers and homemakers and they had their own sphere and they were pretty happy with it because if you're thinking back then uh did they want to go out remember the civil war everyone how brutal and bloody and horrific the civil war was women weren't demanding to be on the front line with muskets back then believe it or not so um i think the first thing to realize is that most of us don't know the real history and that's what the point of the book was for me and i thought it would be about you know who funded suffrage and you know kind of some of the elites behind it and that's definitely covered in the book i do put it put all of that in there 
but I found this amazing thing doing my research. Every time I would profile one of these early suffragists, it would turn out that they were involved in some type of occult practice, whether it be theosophy, uh, automatic writing, spiritualism, uh, mediumship, tarot card reading. Uh, a lot of the English suffragettes were members of the Golden Dawn or the Theosophical Society. A lot of Theosophical Society members here in the United States as well. Mm. And I thought, this is really interesting and I really just can't leave this out there's something here and I've never heard it. So come to find out through a couple more years of research that yes, it was absolutely the, the first wave suffrage was not this innocent voting rights movement. It was an opposition to Christianity. It was a movement toward things like goddess worship, witchcraft, the occult and spiritualism. So it it gets really crazy after that. I'm not sure where you want to. Well, hey, when you, you when, go after when that. you when you talk about that being at the the helm of a lot of it behind the scenes, because of course we just get the the. Uh, the street organizing we get the rallies we get the headlines all of the the wonderful oh there's a you know th there's a, a new wave coming up and and people are being activated and they're they want to claim some new writer that they've been oppressed that's just what we get in mm -hmm. the in the textbooks but behind the scenes when you think about anti-christian especially is there anything more patriarchal than wanting to shake off the the uh shake off the oppression of of god and get away from get away from all of that i mean it's 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 been all about that when i was reading into when i was reading into uh, the 19th amendment a little bit too and i would love for you to go into more or uh, uh, more arguments that that the anti suffragettes were articulating about why why not because i i know that around the time the volstead act and prohibition was a, a very big uh, reason for those who are central planners in this country. Obviously, you have they they go in league with a lot of female rabble rousers who are there to you know inspire and rabble. But, but uh, there's a lot of central planning, uh, big government men who understand that by getting the vote into many more millions of people's hands. And knowing just about how the nature of the sexes really are, women emotion, uh, uh, women on an emotionalist side, uh, their maternal nature, that is taken full advantage of, as we can see, by the central planners who are always pitching the need to create safety nets, security, foreign aid, foreign wars to save oppressed people around the world. I mean, that is something that is always, I mean, they, they're, they're appealing to uh, maternal natures that are all otherwise being told to be get rejected when it comes to creating a nurturing family at home they want to just be protectors of the world and it becomes very goddess like absolutely so um c can you talk a little bit more about the the other reasons why uh women at the time were saying listen i i don't i don't think that this would be good for us yeah so some of the really practical reasons they had were that they did not want to be involved in things like jury duty where they were going to have to hear the horrific details of awful crimes maybe even crimes involving like you know assaults against women or children uh they did not want any they even foresaw so we're talking like late 1800s they're like what if we end up getting drafted right if we if <laughs> we're given total political equality we might end up being drafted someday which seems like it would be incomprehensible at the time but things were just not as different then as we believe now that they were um so they foresaw this and they thought okay if we are granted property rights beyond what we can defend what good does that do us so like let's say i inherit property from my husband and he dies you know he dies i inherit this estate and there's like a an iroquois nation nearby that decides they want to like come and retake my land or something like what am i going to do about it i would have to go hire men like women then kind of understood that having things like property and you know being involved in politics required you to be able to defend that property to defend the nation that you're making these decisions for and not only did they realize they couldn't do that i mean even like, like you said in the intro i'm a firearms instructor it doesn't matter how many guns you give women they are still not men and they still cannot defend the nation and they still cannot defend property against men without the help of men women back then understood this and they just didn't want to be 
tasked with these kind of gruesome things in life, and they also didn't want to become a special interest group. They thought that would be a really bad idea. This is, again, a time we're talking about the golden age where we have these new industrialist, extremely wealthy families like the Vanderbilt, the Carnegie's, the Morgan's, uh, and the Rockefeller's. And these women didn't want to get sucked into that corporate industrial machine either. Mm. Um, they did not like the idea of leaving what they cared about to serve some corporation or some industry. They didn't think that that made sense. Um, so those were like their practical reasons, but also, you know, this was a pretty Christian nation for the most part. And they didn't like the idea of, you know, going against biblical teaching, um, you know, inviting the wrath of God by trying to invert the natural order, things like that. So their women did tend to actually be more conservative. This is another thing that Elizabeth Cady Stanton was always upset about in her writings was that the women were actually back then the more conservative ones. They were the ones that were more interested in family and um, you know community and like those bonds that glue in society that holds things together and creates stability. Because if you wanna raise children, you want stability, you want prosperity, and you don't want chaos and uncertainty and craziness. So the women of the time tended to be actually more conservative. So that begs the question, how did we get this then, right? Yeah. <laughs> if women didn't want this and they weren't demanding it in mass, how did we get it? Exactly, well, exactly. When you, when you talk about, when you when you lay that all out there, that this is something that was really the the vast majority, like even today with how, how the whole concept of abortion has gone from, you know, when we were, when I, when I was growing up in the safe, 90s. Safe, legal, and rare. Safe, legal, and rare to now mm -hmm. it is it is literally celebrated. And we have mm -hmm. Satanic Church saying that it's it's a sacrament of ours. Uh, and it's you're taking away First Amendment religious rights. Uh, so it went from that place to that place. All along the way, though, if you look at the statistics, most women are, are, are against especially the more extreme things that are being pushed today. And by, by and large, it's always been unpopular by a majority, with a majority of women. So again, wh why against, against such pushback and rejection it, is this so easily become normalized and then it's as if there was never any pushback against it at all? Yeah, the, the most succinct way I think I could put it would be to say it was kind of a collusion between uh, industrial elites who I will get into their motivations in just a second and uh, them kind of co-opting the most radical crazy women of the time and pushing them to the forefront putting them in the papers paying for them to go on speaking tours and funding suffrage movements so I'll explain kind of how that happened um, probably the best like uh, example of this would be the relationship between Cornelius Vanderbilt who was the realist uh, railroad mogul of the time, one of the wealthiest men on planet Earth in the late 1800s, and Victoria Woodhull, who was known as Mrs. Satan. Um, she was dubbed <laughs> Mrs. Satan by the papers. And the reason is because she was a really radical progressive, even for her time. She was very like pro-sex work. She was a um, free love advocate. Uh, she was completely against marriage. She went around giving speeches about how marriage was just slavery for women. Um, and she was also a literal snake oil salesman. She was wanted in several states, her and her sister, for selling phony cancer cures, um, doing like, uh, you know, spirit readings or um, telling you your future and things like that, um, and selling actual fake holistic cures for diseases and things like that, and just conning people out of money. So she was an actual like fraudster. And she, she said that she had a spirit come to her, an ancient Greek spirit came to her in a dream and told her to move to New York and go find Cornelius Vanderbilt and give him a spirit reading. And she did. And Vanderbilt was into this sort of thing. He was kind of into lots of spooky occult spiritualism, which was pretty popular among the elite at the time. A lot of them were theosophists or occultists, not always outwardly, but privately at least. Hmm. Uh, he also liked the ladies of the night and Victoria's sister was one of those. And she kind of had a lot of um, associations and prostitution rings in New York also. So she she kind of makes a, a little partnership with Vanderbilt and 
what they did was game the stock market crash, the first stock market crash uh, in the 1890s, and he walked away with millions in today's money from it. Everybody else got completely taken to the cleaners, but Vanderbilt came out like a huge winner. So the the newspapers came to him and they said, you know, I think they were kind of asking him like, uh, what's going on here? They were like, how did you manage to pull this off? And he said, do as I do, consult the spirits. So he said that, you know, through mediumship, through Victoria Woodhull's, you know, woo-woo, um, contacting the dead, he foresaw the stock market crash and that's how he won. The truth is that, she had a ring of prostitutes who were sleeping with his business rivals, including Jim Fisk, another railroad tycoon. And she they were spies. She had a spy network of prostitutes who got insider trading information and helped him game the stock market. So when he got all this money, he gave a bunch of it to her and her sister, and they started their own um, trading brokerage company together and also a newspaper. And their newspaper was the first to publish the Communist Manifesto in the United States. So a lot of these early suffragists were communists. They were socialists. They were involved in, like, utopian community building and things like that too uh, let me ask you something real quick with, with uh, victoria woodhull you said yes now is that her given name at birth or something she took on it's something she took on she okay. did have a couple of marriages yeah okay because i i just thought that that was incredible that she is essentially uh the head of a prostitution spy ring and um uh, Abraham Woodhull, as you, you you may or may not know if you're a history buff, was the leader of George Washington's Culper spy ring in, in Long Island that helped win the <laughs> uh, the Revolutionary she, War. She did have those connections. So I think it was her second husband. Um, might have been her first. I can't remember for sure. But he was a, a military officer who was related. Yes. So she probably did have those connections. And her father, I think wow. her maiden name might have been Claflin. Um, her father was also like another one of these shyster huckster um, snake oil salesmen, um, always in jail, always in trouble. So she had a lot of dubious connections and she had a lot of wealthy elite connections and military connections. And she a lot of suffragists were involved in espionage. In fact, it was one one way that the Civil War um, conducted both sides um, conducted espionage using suffragists because they could say they could let them cross the Mason Dixon line saying, oh, they're going to give a speech or they're going to this uh, convention or this rally. It was a way to get them places. And they were just women. Right. So mm -hmm. it was like a very easy vehicle for this sort of thing and for espionage. But it was also a great way for these elites these industrialists who had been you know opening factories everywhere and needed lots of cheap labor um the same people that funded the suffrage efforts for the most part some of the biggest funders were the same little crew that went to the jekyll island club and created the federal reserve act you guys probably know a little bit about that if you watch frank and how that was passed um yeah they they wanted kind of this whole batch of progressive stuff so they wanted um, the income tax, they wanted the Federal Reserve banking system, and they wanted women's suffrage for the reason that you stated earlier, which is that women are very easily propagandized. That's why every election cycle, what do they do? They tug on your heartstrings. It's always like children and the elderly and the poor and and oh, the, the other side are demonized and they're bad and they don't care about the children, but we care about the children. It's all like yeah. very emotional now because women are actually the largest voting bloc in this country since 1989, I want to say. So it, they knew this. Back then they knew this, that women were easily propagandized. They were easier to sway. It's very easier to get women like to be activists because they f are so like emotional and you can get them really riled up about things like social justice. So, um, yeah, it was kind of a batch where they got women out of the home and into the workplace. So they got all this huge influx of cheap labor, um, mostly in the 70s. It took a little while. It didn't all like happen exactly at once. But in the 70s, women just entered the workforce in mass. Um, but you did start to see women trickling in. You saw more women working after suffrage. So they get more income tax because now they're not just taxing the husband, they're taxing both working parents. And now the children have to go somewhere because mom's not at home educating them. They're not doing like small, small, um, you know, co-ops in their hometown or private schools or anything. So the public school system becomes 
uh, mandatory around the same time. And that's so it, just, it, and that's where you. I've seen Aaron Russo um, yes. talk about this. I actually got it ready for a commercial break tonight after we after we uh, we, we 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 hop off. This is um, this is something that has been talked about a lot there too, and it's just incredible the 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 game planning of all this stuff. All of a sudden, both parents are in in work. They're you know they're chasing the pink elephant. They're grabbing their checks. They're being double taxed, and now these Rockefeller funded public schools are uh, are, are teaching everybody uh, pretty much Howard Zinn's version of American history and where they're supposed to be. And uh, it, it's just wow. Man, and we've, and we've been in this for generations now. Yes. Mm. Yeah, so most people just have no idea about this. They have no idea that the whole thing is kind of a giant con, but it's it's so important. Like, people will kind of be like, why is this your one thing that you're so into? And the reason is because feminism is by far the greatest revolution of all time. It doesn't compare, nothing else compares. You would think maybe the industrial revolution, you would think maybe, you know, like the French or American revolutions, but feminism is truly kind of the root of all of it because it completely changed the whole world in less than a hundred years. In about a half a century, it changed the whole world. Everything about your life, everything you think and do every day that you don't even realize is affected by this. Everything from how ma men and women's relationships work to the institution of marriage, to how children are raised, to how people see themselves, to how power dynamics work, how countries and nations and the world is governed, all affected very deeply by the feminist movement in ways that may not be reversible. I, I don't think it's sustainable based on the fact that we've had crashing birth rates for a century. I mean, we're well below replacement in almost the entire world now. And even Asian countries that are more westernized, like South Korea's birth rate right now is 0 0.78 wow. births per woman. So the average woman there doesn't even replace herself anymore. So uh, this goes into the, the depopulation agenda of the elite as well. This is a fantastic way to convince women because what else happened right after suffrage? The very next thing, birth control. You've got Margaret Sanger, you've got Planned Parenthood, you've got the birth control pill all rolling out right at the same time, also funded by the exact same people, the Rockefellers, the Kaiser Wilhelm Foundation. Um, there's a whole chapter on that in the book as well, because they the first thing they wanted to do after convincing women they must be liberated from the men who protect them, hmm. and that their children must also be liberated from the men who protect them, i.e. their fathers, is that you know the most important thing the only way you're free is if you can have you know um a certain medical procedure that gets rid of unwanted children right we'll just put it that way for youtube purposes yeah and to prevent births because you need to go to work you have to go to school you have to get in debt in college women now hold almost three quarters of all college debt in the united states but they only make an average of 40,000 a year because they get degrees in stuff like psychology, which is the number one women's degree. Um, they, they still do all the same things they did prior to suffrage. This was, this blew my mind to find out. I looked at the top uh, 20 jobs held by women in 2020 versus 1920. They're almost exactly the same, except we swapped farm labor for HR work. Wow. So, Women are secretaries, they're early childhood educators, they're school teachers, they're nurses, they're bookkeepers, they're secretaries. They're doing the same things they did before women's liberation, but now they have to pay someone else to watch their child if they even have a child. And they have to get taxed. They have to pay into the payroll tax and, and all these other taxes. And they're doing to, it to like, do the same thing. They're doing it like you said with a uh, with a degree framed that's not really being used so that they can go into all these other, you know, you're talking about this, um, especially when you talk about children and society and the world being changed within a hundred years. The, the thing that gets me the most, how I see it at least, is just, it's such an unnatural lie all around, but inside yeah. of the lie, there is a nominal amount of privilege that is granted um, to at least one side or another in, in, in the men versus women uh, you know, paradigm that we are living in right now, uh, women are being granted some 
privilege there, whereas responsibility and guilt are usually exclusively given to men about all things. You know, little boys are rapists in waiting that need to yep. they need to sit down. They're always wiggling around. They're a, they're a problem. Um, so in main in a mainstream sense, both sexes are actually controlled and hampered from being who they are. Both of them. I mean, that's that's what I see. And let me just say again that this this method of dividing and conquering is used to create tension uh, in in any number of special interest groups it's race yes. whatever not just between the sexes but this is mostly insidious because the family unit as you said is destroyed it's one thing if you pit white people against black people because it, inside of a white demographic and a black demographic they would still their men and their women would still love and work together and create families and perhaps there would be some kind of tension between the groups themselves but we're going inside we're going inside to fry the circuitry of the species that's what we're doing you're talking that's what you're describing right now yeah so the reason for that because people are like i don't understand how does this how do the religious beliefs tie into this and why should I care about it? And the reason is because if you go back and you read the writings, see this is, nobody's gonna go back and read the writings of feminists from the 17 and 1800s, except me, because I'm a big nerd. But if you do, you it's actually super interesting. So Flora Tristan was one of the first people, she's kind of credited as being the first person to tie Marxism and feminism together during the revolutionary period, late, late 1700s. So this is a long time ago. Um, and people have this idea that first wave was really sensible and reasonable and there was nothing so bad about it. And it made a lot of sense, but it, it just got out of control later. Oh no, absolutely not. First wave was arguably the worst, if you ask me. Um, Flora Tristan was a Marxist, a diehard Marxist and an occultist herself. She was friends with a lot of the most um, prestigious occultists to the elite in Europe at the time, like the French uh, transvestite Simon Guénaud. And she said that you cannot have Marxism, you cannot have communism, communism without women's liberation first. Uh, and, and the Marxists tended to agree with her. And she, she already in the late 1700s was talking about gender abolition, about a future world in which humanity can overcome nature and biology and people can be whatever sex they want. Does that sound familiar wow. to anything that we're dealing with today? Well, I, it is, and, and just to, it, to not, not to interrupt too much because I want you to keep sure. rolling on that, but um, it was put to me not too long ago, I think earlier on this year, really got me, where somebody articulated to me that, that uh, birth control, as you said, that that was the next thing that came along, was the first transhumanist technology. Uh, yes. Where, where it, actually, I think a feminist had, uh, had, had explained this to me, where you're talking about you're talking about the first time that a medical device was rolled out that was meant to prevent a natural thing from happening, to actually alter the functionality of a person to make them into something other than a normal human being, what they do. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally see that this is, and it also, you know what this uh, uh, really shows to me, is the long game that so many of these people that think about how they want to bring the world into new demonic, um, uh, you know, frames of reference and, and states of mind. They really don't care if it's their generation or five lifetimes down the down down the road. But keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and she wasn't the only one. Margaret Fuller was the first feminist writer in America. She was very popular in the mid 1800s. She was part of the Transcendental Club, um, which was like a prototype New Age. Uh, club of you know like free thinkers like ralph waldo emerson and a bunch of other like leading influential intellectuals in america at the time and she wrote that she also she was the first person actually to say gender was a spectrum to come up with gender and call it a spectrum that this was uh there was this divine feminine and this divine masculine in everyone and that there was a spectrum and that she thought in the future when humanity became one and we had a one world government and we had a one world religion that we would also the sexes would become like a blob like a unisex blob there would be no delineation between male and female anymore another example of this um in my follow-up book is going to be heavily about like the eastern feminists like in the Eastern Bloc and Russia, because they had a lot of the same ideas. They were funded by the same people, but it was used slightly differently there. And they had a, the Bolshevik Commissar for Social Welfare was named Alexandra Kolontai, the most powerful woman in the world, probably. 
uh, at the time, and we're talking like the 19 teens, she wrote a, a piece of like fantasy literature where she's imagining the world 70 years after the October Revolution. And she's saying like, in the future, the, the Marxists will have made a communist world. We will have an internationalist, one world government, one world religion. You see this over and over and over in these people's writings. And she said, the next frontier and the final frontier for mankind will be to conquer nature. It will be to conquer biology, hmm. to liberate women from childbearing, to liberate humanity from the bonds of matrimony. She was the first person in the world to create marriage as a state license and not as a religious institution anymore. They, She was very much in charge of oppressing the church in Russia, getting rid of religion, and making everything state run. She wanted communally raised children with no parents. She said children don't need biological parents. They belong to the community. And if you guys remember Hillary Clinton <laughs> talking about how your children do not belong to you, they belong to the country, to the community, to the state. They belong to all of us. It takes a this village. An, yes, exactly. Yeah. It's an old, old Marxist idea, but it but those ideas aren't really just political. They come from this religious belief, this idea of, you know, transcending the human condition, transhumanist, one world government, one world religion type of stuff. And this is if people understand this is a spiritual war and that this is just the political arm of that spiritual war, it makes everything make a lot more sense. Then you can connect everything. Um, another good example of this would be uh, Susanna Budapest. She was the first witch to get witchcraft legalized in the United States. She was an immigrant from the Czech Republic, came here in the 60s. She moved to San Francisco and petitioned the California government and said, look, you're supposed to have freedom of religion here in America, which means you can't tell me I can't practice witchcraft. And she actually convinced them. And the state of California was the first to remove witchcraft laws. Hmm. So she started her first, the first legal witch coven in America was called the Susan B. Anthony Coven Number One. Wow. That's what she named it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. A little, little, so, little tip of the cap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and she was, you guys might remember when Trump got elected, there were these witches who were hexing Trump and casting spells. In Brooklyn. That was in the news. She was actually, she's still alive today, and she was one of the leaders of that. This um, everybody do a witchcraft spell during the full moon and hex Donald Trump. That was her. So, yeah, this stuff is people don't realize it. You wouldn't necessarily know that feminism is like a witchcraft occult idea but it absolutely is and it's it's this dialectical opposition between like goddess worship and opposition to god the father mm. they don't like the idea of god the father they don't like the idea of old testament patriarchs um in the orthodox and and ca even in the catholic church we have patriarchs it's what we call them uh they don't like this male oriented phallogocentrism they want goddess worship they want the divine feminine um you guys might be interested to know that the first women's magazine ms magazine which was created by the cia it was funded and created with gloria steinem and the cia working together um it's called ms magazine and it came out in the early 70s and they're marketing this magazine to suburban housewives so what was the very first cover of the first issue of Ms. Magazine it was actually the Hindu goddess Kali, who is a terrifying, uh, you know, six to eight armed goddess, depending on which depiction you go by. She has dark blue or black skin. She wears a garland of men's severed heads around her neck. She wears a garland of men's severed arms as a belt. And in Hinduism, she's like the, the dark mother. She's this like, uh, birthing destroying figure and um she her sacrifice that she requires is the blood of men oh, well <laughs> one of the most prolific serial color kilts in all of history if you look in the guinness book of world's records they were called the thuggies our our word thug like the criminal word thug comes from the word thuggy 
and they were um, a group in India that sacrificed male travelers to the goddess Kali in large numbers for centuries until the British Empire like eradicated them. I, you know, I was waiting for you. I was waiting to see where the CIA was going to come up in this because I, mm-hmm. I, I read it in the description of the book, and I, I knew that we would touch witchcraft and demon worship and spirit mediums really quick. But the CIA, I did not know that they. Um, that they they went into into business with Gloria Stein. I mean, I mean, she's always she's always dripped of that. I mean, she glows so bright. But yes. um, you know that that's not surprising, but um, edifying nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, what about magic mushrooms? What I hear about this, and then I want to get back to witchcraft because you know, actually, let's just do that first because I hear, I think you and I were speaking not too long ago, and uh, and I. You told me that there are quite a few witches out there who are, really appreciate your work because you're, you're giving, you're essentially giving them their due. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. I have this small following of witches who actually are big fans of my work because they're like, finally, someone is recognizing that like this is our major contribution to history and that it's really us. It's really witchcraft that has led the charge in liberating women. And so like, there, everyone's heard of the witch trials. Everybody's seen the movies, the Hollywood version of witch trials. And um, it's true that there was some times and places that there was hysteria and there were certainly people who were wrongfully persecuted. But you may not know, and I, I got this information from witches themselves. There's a witch academic named Kristen Soleil who works at the New School. She's a professor in New York at the New School. And she's a second generation witch herself. And her specialty also is feminism and witchcraft. And she says that in all of her studies, she found that oftentimes the reason women were persecuted and accused of witchcraft was because they were midwives. And what did midwives do? Midwives were the person who would provide an abortion for you prior to the 1950s when it became medicalized. Prior to the 1950s, it was always like a midwife or somebody like that who would do such a procedure. Um, Anything from herbal tinctures, um, herbal preparations of some kind, you know, medicinal preparations to very crude surgical procedures. And this goes way back, like way, way back in history that midwives were generally, witches were the people who you went to for such a procedure. Um, Also, other reasons they were persecuted legitimately, like at least from a Christian perspective, I'm not saying that murdering witches is good. or that, you know, which trials were good. You guys can decide if you think that's good yourselves. But from the perspective of Christian Europe, these women who were in witch covens, they actually would use psychedelics as part of their rituals. Now, sex magic is the most powerful type of magic. It's the preferred, you know, spell if you really want to get stuff done. Um, And witches were known for being able to use poisons if you wanted to poison some somebody, you went to a witch and you got a poison prepared. Um, and they would use psychedelic salves like um, magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, depending on what part of the world you were in, there's different types of natural psychedelics. And they would prepare um, psychedelics and use them in sex magic practices. And this is actually where the flying witch on a broomstick comes from. So the broomstick was basically used as a phallic instrument that you would put the salve on. I know it's a little graphic. Sorry, everybody. Sorry if I'm. It's all right. It's all right. They 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 watch yeah. me every night. They're fine. <laughs> They've been <laughs> so desensitized. That, this is where the flying witch on the broomstick kind of came from, is because orgiastic sex magic involved broom handles and and lube that had psychedelics in it, basically. And so they were flying, if if you get my drift there. And they were often also persecuted oh. because they engaged in, uh, you know, sex practices that were not legal or were frowned upon at the time, like orgies, full moon orgies, lesbian stuff, things like that. So you can actually see how from the perspective of the church, these were things that were illegal and not allowed and you might get in trouble if you got caught doing them. Certainly, if if a husband found out that his wife secretly went to a witch for an abortion, um, you were gonna get in trouble for that back then, you know? So I'm not, I'm not saying it's a good thing, I'm just saying there were actual reasons why those things happened. There were reasons why witches were persecuted by Christians according 
according to that morality. It, yeah. it does make sense. So, um, but they always saw that the people who are into witchcraft always see the church as like their, you know, opposition. It's a, it's a dialectical thing. There's a guy, um, a wonderful professor from Sweden who wrote a book, his PhD thesis is called satanic feminism. And he writes in his book and he's a Satanist himself. He's actually a Luciferian. So again, from his perspective, this is good. From my perspective as a Christian, I would say it's not. Uh, but he even says that the suffragettes and the women's liberators of the 19th century adopted Lucifer as their symbol of liberation. Lucifer was the one who gave Eve the knowledge of good and evil. He's the liberator of humankind. He's the Prometheus figure. He's the liberator. So it's not just me saying that women's liberation has satanic and Luciferian and occultic roots. It's the suffragists and the feminists themselves who agree with me so it's not some wild thing i made up because i'm some crazy fundamentalist no lady. no no and i and i just got t i got a text message from my my friend john paul rice and he's he's listening right now and he said she's very well understood by me everything begins and ends with the mother in all dimensions of our reality they had to corrupt eve first and of course here you are bring you know, just dropped eve there uh, you know and you and what you're talking about there like the witches appreciate your work um, it's evident that where you know there's always that's that period of time where the conspiracy theorists they go out there and they make their claims and they show their evidence and they and they they reach their conclusions with their hypotheses and all that and uh, and people will say oh you're 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 exaggerating oh you know you're put, taking this too far or there's nothing going on here like that at all and it always comes to you know sometimes you have to wait a couple of months sometimes you have to wait a couple of decades but uh it always bears itself out first wave it's just voting rights frank Yep. Second wave, you got your bra burning. Third wave, it's, you know, now we have the intersectionality, recreational abortion and all that. But the th in, in this third wave right now, the public embrace and the w rise, this has been covered by news outlets, right wing, left wing, apolitical, that the rise in witchcraft is is just, especially in the last 10 years, through the roof. Yes. So it is, um, obviously people have been pulled away from traditional religions, obviously Christianity, very instrumental in building Western civilization. A, a lot of that tradition has been completely squelched out of people. But now, you know, we are spiritual beings and it's not like people are just walking around, around inert. Some of them are. It makes you a little bit more impressionable, but other yeah. people, they want some kind of an outlet to plug their spirit into. And here is this very empowering witchcraft. You are the you are the god. You are the goddess. You can pack, yeah. cast your spells, change the world around you. It's, uh, it, it's on the rise. It's been covered in very, very big ways. I'm always keeping an eye on it. So you, you can yeah. tell it's evident now that this is a, a time, a very apocalyptic time where it's, it's just being revealed. Yeah, uh, witchcraft and various forms of witchcraft, whether it's Wicca, green witchcraft, they have all these different kinds of witchcraft ever since the big revival. We had another big revival of this in the 70s. Um, it's one of the fastest growing religions in all Western nations, all. The UK, Canada, the United States, Aust Australia, uh, witchcraft is always among the fastest growing religions while Christianity is on the decline. And this, again, was not like an unintended consequence. This was part of the plan. Case in point would be, uh, a lot of people might not know that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and a couple dozen other suffragists rewrote the Bible from a feminist perspective in 1895. You can still get it on Amazon right now. It's called The Woman's Bible. And in the preface, Elizabeth Cady Stanton herself says we took six years to go through the entire Bible and we took out all the parts that referenced women in any way and we reinterpreted them from a feminist perspective. And she says in the preface, and she's always referred to as a Christian. If you go look up their bios, like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, it will say they were Christians. They absolutely were not. They were diametrically opposed and hated Christianity. And Stanton says in her own preface, look, I'd love to banish the Bible and Christianity and canon law and the Mosaic law from the face of the earth if I could. But that's vain. 
it's too influential and too many people think that the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, it's the, it's the only thing standing between us and our political goals for women's liberation and her spiritual goals. She again is another person who referenced the Mahatmas and the occult and universalism and a lot of these theosophical ideas as where we should go. And she said, so we're just gonna rewrite it. We're gonna take the parts that are patriarchal out and we're going to put gender neutral or feminist parts in. Other than that, we'll leave the rest of it alone. But she even said in the preface, she doesn't really, she doesn't think any man ever spoke to God. She doesn't think the Bible's divinely inspired. And so why not just rewrite it? You would never hear that in a history class. You would never hear this in an American history class as what the suffragists were about. You always just hear that they were brave, uh, wonderful women who sacrificed for the sake of their fellow women. And, and my thinking is, I'm a woman, I have four daughters, and if this was a movement that was supposed to be for me and for my daughters, the least you can do is tell me the truth about it. Mm -hmm. I at least, and all the other women out there, at least deserve to know the real actual history, the real truth, what these people actually thought and believed, and not this fairy tale version we've heard that men throughout all of history have been on this you know, they just wake up in the morning going, how can I oppress me some women today? How can I just, I hope I can get away with beating a woman today. That men didn't care about their mothers. They didn't care about their sisters, their wives, their daughters. They just wanted to keep them down under the thumb of the patriarchy. None of that is true. If you go back and actually read the writings of these women themselves, you'll find that. That's why it's very hard to find them. Most people don't ever read them. Yeah. So you just you just believe what you've heard. Oh, I'm and I'll, I'll tell you. And here's what I want to do, um, because it's already ten after eight, and I don't want to. Do you have any time constraints? Because I don't want to keep you too long. If you have to, I, you, I can stay until like eight forty-five. Okay. Well, all right. Well, it's eight ten. I, I I would what I would love to try, and everybody at home, remember this is a very crude um, attempt at taking calls with a a guest on because I have to figure out some other way um but what i can do right now is i i just put a number on the screen i know that there's a lot of people that probably have questions for you especially women who are yeah. saying and I'm, I'm sure you get challenged all the time by women who say okay rachel i i see where you're going with the danger to the family i see the demeaning of men as a problem i, I mean e even um even uh you know uh, uh, uh camille paglia even will will come out and talk about how what is being done to men is wrong and transgenderism is a dangerous fad that we see yeah. throughout history it happens when civilizations decline and just flake apart but you know and there'll be others that will say and it's obvious that the the cause of abortion is clearly diabolical at this point if it's always been that way or it just it just mutated even worse than it was in the beginning when we all we heard was safe and rare and legal but yeah. you know what about workplace mistreatment what about hiring quotas hasn't feminism helped create laws that give women a shot at gainful employment especially when they're single when they don't have a family um you know to give them opportunity and protection where only prejudice once reigned i'm sure you get a lot of that uh, so yeah. what 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 I want to first of all you can answer that in just a second but what I will say to the audience 914-369-1236 here's how this has to work because Rachel cannot hear you cannot hear Rachel but Rachel can hear you it's a very weird confessional kind of a thing going on right now Rachel can hear you so you have to call in with a very concise question um and and then hang up and listen to your answer. I, I wish it could be a little bit more conversational in the future. It will. But 914-369-1236. Get your calls coming in. In the meantime, Rachel, uh, can you talk a little bit generally about the kind of challenges you get from women, especially who are not... Uh, you know, rabid progressives that say, hey, listen, you know, I, I, I know about all the, the dangers to the family and to men and boys and all that, but there are certain things that we needed that, that we didn't have and now we do. What, 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 what do you usually, uh, kind of exchanges you have with them? Well, I actually do a lot of debates against feminists. That's kind of one of my, one of my hobbies. Um, I've done a, quite, quite a few high profile debates. Um, against everything from like radical progressive atheist feminists to like christian women who just disagree with me and want to challenge some of the stuff i say and 
there's the last chapter in my book goes over all the the statistics, which probably a lot of people may know some of it, but they may not know how bad it is. Um, and I have a recent piece on my Substack. If you guys want to read more stuff, you don't maybe want to jump into the book right away. Uh, rwilson.substack.com. The like two posts ago, I did one called "Our Patriarchs Protectors." And it goes over the last 45 years of data we have from the National Incident Study, which is this nationwide study that the government, the federal government collects data from everything from women's shelters to child protective services, to emergency rooms, to advocacy groups. And they gather data about all of the incidents they can find proof of where women or children are abused. And what we find unequivocally like it's not even close is that the safest situation for women and children is married to their husband and the children living with both biological parents no other living situation even comes close any deviation from that ends up with more abuse not less including cohabitating so women seem to think that uh if i get married i'll be trapped and that's dangerous so i'll just live with my boyfriend because then i can leave those situations are statistically a lot more abusive than married couples. Um, same thing with children. Any any deviation from both married biological parents has higher rates, and not just a little. Like we're talking anywhere from ten to twenty times higher rates of abuse, um, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, um, material, and any kind of abuse you can think of. Um, and I don't think that that's purely coincidental. There are people out there who want the protectors of women and children removed because if you're a predator, I mean, getting dad out of the way, getting the husband out of the way helps a lot. Getting fathers removed from women's lives, we see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll usually go over a lot of the statistics because numbers, people can understand numbers. I don't have to use a bunch of philosophy or religion or history, which can be kind of abstract and debatable. I can use numbers and show people that no, if what you want for women is better quality of life, more safety, all the things feminism promised, promised us, it promised us safer living situations, better quality of living. Um, better income. It didn't do any of those things. Like I said, women hold the majority of college debt. They still don't make a whole lot of money. And that's not really because of some gender wage gap. It's because a lot of women still want to have children and they still want to have a family. And the things they're interested in are not things that pay really well, to be perfectly honest. That is, a, so, it's, a, it's a good point. And I, I, hold on, let's let's get to our first call because yeah. you're really you're really rolling there. Let's see, okay, four, <laughs> four, two, three, you're on the air. You get to ask a question of Rachel Wilson. Remember, she cannot, uh, you cannot hear her talking back. So make sure that the, please turn that off in the background and ask okay. your question. Okay, go right ahead. You want ahead. me to ask my question? Yes, okay. go right, you're on with Rachel. So I am very excited that I got to watch Rachel today. I came, I've just come in from a school board meeting. I live in Hamilton County, Tennessee, and we are currently inundated with this witchcraft in our county, in our government here locally, and in our school system. <clears throat> um, she mentioned the, of course, the Department of Education starting in the 70s, but I would like to know her thoughts on Sexual abuse in the school systems. We currently have a situation in our county, it's gone national this week, where two trans activist substitute teachers were arrested for prostitution in our county. And this is an epidemic here. And it's all connected to a lo local social justice group who are directly tied to witchcraft. And they're very open about it. So I would just like to get her thoughts on just everything that's happening in the public school system now as it pertains to this topic. Thank you. And what's your name again, caller? Um, I'm Rebecca from Tennessee. Rebecca, thank you so much for the call. Okay, Rachel, what do you think about Rebecca's uh, comments and question? I think I might know what Rebecca's talking about. There is a social justice feminist witch group in Tennessee that I've, I've watched their videos. Um, I followed, I think they have a Twitter that I followed for a while. Um, and they are extremely open about this. And if it's the one I'm thinking of, they have summer camps for children. Yes, they have summer camps for children where they teach them about 
feminism, trans ideology, witchcraft. Um, and for some reason, there's people who bring their children to this. Now, the thing about it is that when you get women away from the men are kind of the stabilizing factor. And when you separate women from men, they're very vulnerable, like I said, to propaganda, to ideological indoctrination. Um, they they still want a sense of community and protection, but they, they, they've been convinced that men are dangerous. Men are risky and dangerous abusers. So they will gravitate towards groups like this, thinking it offers some kind of protection. Uh, but the public school system, there's more abuse in the public school system than there is in like the Catholic church. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? People think the Catholic church is really bad. The public school system is worse. Dwarfs it. And yeah. And I like, this is why I'm a homeschooling advocate. This is why I, I urge people to take your children out of public schools, do homeschool co-ops. It's fantastic. I mean, for all the bad things the internet does, the, one of the good things is it makes homeschooling really easy. This set of books behind me, is from Mott Media, and this is all learning materials that are like classic trivium, quadrivium stuff from before the public school system, from before Common Core, fantastic stuff. If you go to Mott Media, they'll actually give you a 15% discount code if you use Rachel15. Um, I'd like that. Regardless, I'd like there's to do that. Tons, yeah, there's tons of great programs that you can use, that you can do, you can get involved with local communities, homeschool co-ops, with your church group, and homeschool together. Um, one of my favorite books about this is School World Order by John Kleisek, and he is absolutely phenomenal. You can see this is a thick book. Yeah, it is. Um, and he talks about the founding of the public school system and how the Skull and Bones Society actually created our public school system. It's extremely well documented. Like he does not joke around, he's a professor himself. And um, he shows you exactly how and why this corporatized globalist education system was implemented in the United States, where it comes from, what it's for. And certainly today, uh, most children's first violent experience is in a public school. Most children end up pretty traumatized from public school. There is, I mean, everything from bullying, um, to, you know, this trans stuff. And like she was saying, the, um, the abuse from the adults that are involved because you guys have probably seen libs of TikTok. You've probably seen all the preschool teachers and kindergarten teachers who go into the profession for the purpose of subverting the institution and indoctrinating your kids. They don't even hide it. No. They're there to do that. And like she said, this, this radical group can come right out and say that's what they're doing because they have multiple layers of protection from social justice lobbying groups because we have freedom of religion because we have you know all these freedoms that have been exploited and co-opted by these groups uh if you guys remember the gay san francisco men's choir singing we will we will come for your children yeah they're not kidding they're very serious and they're it's right in your face now they don't have to hide it anymore uh, let's let's take a uh take another one uh 909 <laughs> are you there hello hello yes hi hi frank Yes, uh, my question is... Who's this? Uh, Who's this? Who's this? I'm sorry. It, this is Melby. Melby, welcome to the show. Okay, so you are on with Rachel right now. She can hear you. You won't hear her. So uh, you just say whatever's on your mind and then hang up and listen to the uh, the, the answer. Go right ahead. Okay, yes. Um, as far I have a question. Um, the, what is the name of that lady and what year did that come into place um, that you were talking about? She was the first to do... Do something okay. That's my first question. And wait, 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 wait. wait. Fortunately, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Who, who was the okay. name of the lady who was the first to do something? Yes, I don't. It was something that she said just like uh, fifteen minutes ago. Well, she's been talking about a lot of people doing a lot of firsts. I, I don't. I, I wonder know. if she's um, talking it, about. It had something to do with the suffragettes. She was the first one to implement. Um. I don't know. Was it trans something or other? I, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I'll, we'll see what we can. What she can dig up. What's the other question? Yeah. Okay. And okay. And uh, unfortunately, I did walk with the suffragettes um, in Colorado about ten years ago. Now that I have found this out, I kind of like it repulses well, me. And also, what was the last question? Oh, that's it. I'm done. Well, well, I have a question for you, real quick. You said you you were walking with suffragettes in Colorado. What were they What were they protesting for? Is, uh... 
they were protesting women's rights, women's right to vote. It was like the the simple thing that they came out with in the very beginning of the suffragettes. Wow. Over I mean, we, we even dressed up in that era. We even dressed in that era. Uh, I dressed. I went to the thrift store. I found clothes that was from that era and shoes, which was really hard. But <laughs> yeah, and we, we we walked all through Colorado. It was a very small town, Montrose. And we walked all through there. We were in the paper and everything. And I thought it was a really good thing. Well, but now that I, I hear all this other stuff, you know, there's just the, you know wow. what it is. Don't 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 uh, don't feel uh, you know ashamed or anything like that. Just oh, I'm not ashamed. Yeah, I'm not ashamed. It's just because I didn't know. Yeah, exactly. Know. There's just there, it's just there's so much more to everything that no nobody ever know you were you were there. You were in the moment. Thank you for the call. Let me work through that because you know because uh, Rachel. Um, oh, gee, oh, what the heck what was what was the second thing she had just said about? Um, I'm I'm blank on the second thing she said. Uh, well, her first question, yeah. I think she was referring to when I was talking about Flora Tristan and Margaret Fuller. Those were the two that had the gender ideology way back in the you know, late 1700s to mid 1800s, talking about gender being a spectrum and eventually eliminating gender and sex differences altogether and everybody being this like unisex blob and in the future we'll have technology we'll have ecto wombs which you're seeing you're seeing people yep the artificial surrogates and in vitro and then now they're trying to do artificial womb technology and these people foresaw this in the late 1700s so um go you can read both of these women online if you google their stuff like project gutenberg probably has all their stuff um margaret fuller and Flora Tristan. Okay. Are the two. That yeah. makes sense. And I, I remember now what she was talking about. She was saying that I, I marched with the suffragettes. First of all, I knew that she wasn't that old. So it had to be <laughs> something that was ceremonial. It's probably coming up on the 100-year anniversary and yes. all that stuff. But, um, you know, and, and on November 2nd, I'm going to have a good friend of mine, Chris Ann Hall, back on the show. And she is a constitutional attorney, a historian. And, um, and I've talked to her about this in relation to the 19th Amendment as well uh, she and she said straight up that i forget what the details of the of the the conversation were afterwards because it was like maybe about a year or so ago but that uh there was a lot of disinformation about there now obviously what you're saying is um for for everything that was being presented to the public about the suffrage movement it was being resoundedly rejected uh obviously yeah. that whole side of the story was buried over time and as the the winners of the legis on the legislative side has made that the more prominent piece of history that everybody knows but chris ann i remember her telling me that frank you know women blacks they were not only voting prior to the 19th amendment but they were they were holding elected office for you know over over 100 years at that point um, yeah. and, and it's just that it's just that once again we're talking about state law versus federal yes. so you know everybody thinks that there was just no representation whatsoever that right. if you were a woman and I and you you brought this up before this is a very real thing I see it in the memes that are shared. I know this is just how boys and girls in school today, they look at history, and I know some of them, if they have a good upbringing, they don't look at it that way. But by and large, it's just accepted that prior to the 1960s, marriage was just a mix of, for at least for a woman, cooking, breeding, and getting slapped around. They, yep. they, they, I mean, this is, this is what a lot of boys and girls believe, that women just, and, and that's what happens here. Boy, women get the chip on their shoulder when they're young now in the 20th, 21st century. They get a chip on their shoulder, and boys get the guilt of being, you know, abusers in waiting that need to be suppressed. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, incre it's incredible. Yeah, another person to read for sure, especially for the lady that just called, is Matilda Joslyn Gage. She was on the committee for the Woman's Bible. She worked with uh, Stanton and Anthony all the time, but she got kicked out of all the suffrage groups a lot because she was one of the most radical. Um, Stanton and, and um, Anthony agreed with her. They held most of the same beliefs, but they knew not to say the quiet part out loud so much, right? They kind of knew you can't just come right out with it. But she wrote a book called uh, Women, Church, and State, which is extremely radical for the time. I was just rereading some of it today. And uh, she was a theosophist. She was also the mother-in-law of L. Frank Baum, who wrote the Wizard of Oz books. And she was, she, she had him 
join the Theosophical Society with her. And that is where the archetype of the good witch came from because she wanted to uh, reframe the witchcraft archetype. And uh, so he wrote Glenda the Good Witch, inspired by her, and she saw the church as this evil entity that oppressed women, and she was a big advocate of Native American rights, which I don't think in and of itself is a bad thing, but one of her arguments was that among the Iroquois nations in upstate New York, where she was from, that the... um, the birth of an unwanted child according to the natives this is what she said i'm not even saying she was right she may not have been right about this but this was what she was saying that among the iroquois women they said to give birth to an unwanted child is a crime against the mother and a sin against the spirit of the unborn child therefore among the natives abortion was this widespread totally accepted wonderful thing and that because they only had children they wanted all the children were sacred and treated wonderfully and Mm. and they just didn't have these problems and she's often portrayed in modern times as having been against this and that you can go back and read her own words and see that she absolutely was not so this is just another example of it being so twisted and theosophy is like a very occult it's like western occult magic it's alistair crowley was a theosophist it's that kind of black magic stuff and this is like one of the top figures in the women's liberation movement. She's widely like admired by every woman's studies professor on, on planet Earth. And this is the belief system that these things came from. But in, in modern times, we've, ha- we've got all women convinced that this is the good stuff. This is what's good for them. It's liberating. It's benevolent. It's wonderful. And that men are these oppressive patriarchal abusers that, that have to be, you know, triumphed over we have to smash the patriarchy and all that stuff so i you know i I was i was hoping in the um i was hoping we had at least you know one or two people um call (laughs) in i i want to i actually i was i was interested to hear a challenge um just because you know this is um i'll put it to you this way you had mentioned before about about all of the people in your life, and maybe this is the last thing that we cover because I think it was nice that we took two calls at least, and now they're kind of just. Um, I just want to. I want to just cruise into the end here, but you had opened up talking about how so many people in your life, even those who are of the Christian, conser- you know, politically conservative side of things, were were trying to get you to reject this path you were on of of going into the home and taking care of the children and and just being the the matriarch of the family and yeah. and, and and taking that taking up that that traditional mantle and i said well you know this is something i always wanted to talk about because i i see that there is feminism's got the right wing's got a big time feminism problem and now whether that is because the men have kind of vacated their roles a lot that it just creates a void and naturally women step into it but it, it's a it's one of those things where whether you're left wing or right wing we are now a hundred years or so into this 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 mindset that every every woman out there is is uh is living a way that if if it changed in any in any way now it's they'll feel like they're being oppressed so how do you how do you I don't know how, how do you reconcile that it, it's a it's a big thing I, I know you said I don't even know how it gets corrected because how do you correct it I, I guess it would just take time especially if the propaganda apparatus is neutralized somehow it would take a couple of generations to wash it through I know that the new generation coming up is seeing is seeming to be a little bit more trad uh, they're, they're becoming a little bit more interested in what their parents reject so obviously yeah. conservatism is becoming a little bit more punk rock traditional relationships are becoming a little bit more punk rock now who knows how far that goes but you know left right or in the middle I mean, everybody lives like a, a, a diva in, in one way or another these days, and I don't know. I, I guess we're all we're all. It affects us all. I I, I have to imagine that's going to be a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. It is. Um, I get a lot of messages from people that are like, oh, "I just read your book or watched some of your stuff, and now I'm sitting here just like my mind is blown, and like, what do I do with this information? You know, know. it's kind of black pilling to a lot of people and it's very 
It is. It's one of those, you know, like all of us have our red pill moment that we can look back to where we realize that things weren't what they seemed or that a lot of things we've been told were not true. Um, and this is definitely one of those things for people. And I'll say there's some there's some big silver linings and some reasons to be encouraged. So maybe we'll, we can close on that. Um, this weekend, I traveled to a wedding for my friends and there was a, a young lady at the church who came up to me and she said, are you are you Mrs. Wilson? And I said, yeah, that's me. And she's like, oh my gosh, I love your stuff. Um, I got your book and then I started watching your YouTube channel and I just wanted to tell you that I'm married now and I'm expecting my first baby and I'm, I'm going to stay home. You know, I, I decided, you know, my husband and I, we had to downsize a little bit to make it work, but but I'm going to stay home and I'm going to raise my kids. I'm going to homeschool them. And I wanted to thank you for giving me like, uh, you know, something to tell my family and my parents. Cause even again, her parents are Christians. They're, they would consider themselves like conservative Republican voters. And they were very concerned because she had a very good job. They were very concerned about her giving up her career and being dependent on her husband's income and staying home with her child. They I, said, you know, you know what? what? You regret it. And I, I, I and, 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 and there is a part of me that can that that actually a large part of me that really I can uh, empathize with the parents, yeah. too. If for no other reason, obviously, it is not a cultural norm anymore. Um, right. And perhaps it will, perhaps we're starting to create momentum in that direction again. But if for no other reason than the economy, the way that the world is being squeezed of all all of its wealth, and how they're really mm -hmm. destroying the middle class in such a way that there are a lot of parents out there that really truly would love to live like this that cannot yeah. afford it. They can't swing it on one person's income. It's so it's it everybody's getting their arms twisted in a number of ways. There is a propaganda aspect, but there is also just the the, the controllers, the the you know, you know, the money changers out there have really made it hard for people to be able to make this work economically. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um in my book, the chapter on the financing goes over like Alva Vanderbilt Belmont was the primary uh, funder of the suffrage movement here in the United States. And she was married to not one, but two global elite bankers. Uh, she was married to Cornelius Vanderbilt's grandson, got a divorce from him, got the biggest divorce settlement in history at the time, and then married um, Belmont, who was a Rothschild banker. So if that tells you where this money is coming from and who wanted these things, that, that will probably let you know. But um, there's ways to do it. It's not easy. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. It's going to you're going to have to forego a lot of materialism and um, probably live more simply and more frugally. That's certainly what we did. But remember that that's temporary, right? If you have to move out of the big city, you can, um, you know, your husband can work a job where he leaves the house and maybe you work part time from home or maybe you have a remote job that's 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week. Whatever you have to do, do it. I know a lot of my like uh, mom friends, uh, two of them are nurses, so they just work like two days a week, two 12 hour shifts. So they still do have to work, but they're home most days and they're spending most of their time with their kids. Uh, one of my other friends started a daycare. Now, we don't love daycare, but she's like, look, I want to stay home with my kids. So one way I can do that is to have my kids at home with me and then and babysit, you know, four or five other kids while I'm doing that and bring in some money, whatever you have to do. But I think the biggest thing we need to think about is the backwards advice we give women, which is we tell them invest all your fertile years in your university education and your career. And then after you get your financial stability and a career built, suddenly flip a switch and become a stay at home mom. That's incredibly difficult to do. It's highly unrealistic. It makes no sense. Why would you invest 40 to $80,000 in debt? Why would you spend 10 years and then at 30, when your fertility is already starting to decline now, now you're going to try to switch gears and be a stay-at-home mom. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. Yeah. So I tell I tell women, flip it around. And I know this sounds crazy because you haven't heard it. It's opposite of what you've been told your whole life. But marry young and have your kids young. Have your children in your 20s. There's a lot of life after that. I'm 43, I'm almost done. My youngest child is seven years away from being a legal adult. I have two kids in their 20s. Now I have some time to do stuff like write books and talk to Frank. And 
do some things on the side to help with the income. But for a lot of years, it was my husband working 60 hour weeks, me cutting people's hair on the side to make a little extra cash and trying to do, and just us trying to get along. Was it a little hard? Yeah, but the time to do that is when you're young. And then as your kids get older and you get older, things change and circumstances improve and your income will grow as your family grows, right? So I did do a, an episode on this, like on the financial aspects of this with Pearl Davis over at uh, Just Pearly Things. Um, so if you do wanna go watch that, there's a video on that over there. But um, yeah, my advice is to flip the script, do your family first. And um, like one of my friends, who raised her three children at home. She got a uh, early childhood education degree. She, it took her 10 years cause she did it incrementally while she was raising her own kids. She paid cash for it. She didn't have to go into any debt. And now her youngest just left home. And now she is going into like full-time educator work. And she's probably got another 25 years before she has to retire that she can build more savings and build more money and, and build for their retirement. So you have to get creative. You have to think of ways around the system, but to the extent that more mothers stay home, it will actually help with some of this stuff in a lot of ways, right? It drove wages down. There's a, I'm not saying this is the sole cause. I know the difference between correlation and causation, but when mothers entered the workforce in mass in the early seventies, is when wages began to really stagnate and they've never really recovered. And it's like, if you flood the workforce with women who weren't there prior, it's going to have some effect on the wages. So when more women stay home or when more women work remotely and things like that, it is going to change things. And if we can convince people that family and, and the future generations are worth investing in, the future belongs to those who show up for it. Hmm. I, I would not let these globalist depopulationists convince you that having a child is killing the planet and that you're better off letting your genetic lineage die out. I would not listen to them. I would do whatever you can to get married, stay married, and have your family. Don't let them take that from you with their nonsense. It's it's not easy, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. Just a wonderful, what a wonderful talk we had. I, I can't. I would love to have you back uh, sometime, especially after I read the book. Maybe sometime in 2024. But in the meantime, I have your link tree in the description of the episode. I've already seen quite a few people already said that they put your book inside of their shopping basket on Amazon. I hope more of them do that. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug before we uh, depart, Rachel? I had such. A, I had. A, I had a great evening this evening. I did too. Thank you so much for having me on. I knew this was going to be a great talk. Um, you guys can go to my little YouTube channel. It's just Rachel Wilson. Um, and then I have a sub stack with lots of my other fun writings on there. Um, that's rwilson.substack.com. So there you go. Well, Rachel, thank you for everything. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Frank. There you go. There, that was a, a very, very, I didn't expect to have that much time with her and I'm glad that we did. Glad we did almost the whole show. Oh man. All right. So now what do we do? You know, here's the thing. I'm going to go on a really quick intermission when we come back. Who knows how much time? I, tomorrow is Friday. I can take a lot of calls tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, Matt will be in studio. I have a little something for you. I told you it is an old article. I want to just read some quotes from an article that interviewed Nikola Tesla about his views on marriage and women and why he felt he would probably get never get married. This is in 1924, 1925. You've got to hear what he says. We'll be right back. It's intermission time, folks. Time out to press the like button. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to intermission. We'll, we'll be right back. Yeah. Intermission. Yeah, intermission. No.
entering, quite frankly. 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 We all support. Quite frankly. Not quite. Quite frankly. Let's go, Brandon. Quite frankly. In Roma, Italia. Quite frankly. You're going on Frank's show tonight? I want to get a Coke. Can I get a Coke? So everybody watch. Quite frankly. With Frank. Quite frankly. How dare you? I wonder what people have been saying about my shirt tonight. <laughs> it's a uh, Adel four one two. He told me once. He said, "Hey Frank, what's your shirt size? So you can send me a large. I'm going to send you one of my uh, one of my shirts he made. It's like a golf shirt. It looks like more like a bowling shirt to me, but it's got like a golf thing on it. And um, it showed up just a couple of days ago. After all this time, I forgot about it. And it just showed up at the PO box. And uh, I said, you know what? It's Thursday night. I got to go on uh, taking it back at four o'clock. I'm going to wear Adel's shirt and surprise him. And then I said, you know what? I'm wearing it all night. And it feels very, very soft. So, um, if you don't like it, you can go to hell. Go to hell with the feminists. All right, so, here, let's go um, to the Super Chats, and then we'll go to everything else. All right, on quite frankly, superchat.com, Norwe- Northwest Grandma says, My husband was the sole breadwinner, starting out very humbly. We found that me staying home and providing a calm, stable environment helped him to excel in his job. No business clothes needed for me, no daycare expenses, no fast food meals. That sounds nice. Great. That sounds great. Northwest Grandma. I hope I hear a phone call from her. And listen, I know it was only two calls tonight. Even King wanted to get on. Um, I know it was only two calls tonight, but it was a very big experiment. I think it worked out nice. I wish that there could be... I, I don't know what the, the, the solution is going to be to be able to bridge the gap between a call-in feature that there is a telephone line that can that can create some kind of interactivity. If Zoom were able to perfect its uh, its operation there and give me a little bit of what I need in merging calls and all that other stuff without losing the video stream, then, but I think that that was pretty great. I just wish that they could hear each other. It actually made me feel really good to see that go off as smoothly as it did. The Sentinel, now at Rockfin, Sentinel was on Theta. Poor Sentinel. Nomadic man. Great show, Frank. Rachel Wilson is a great guest. Spot on. We are so glad that she is doing what she is doing. Molly already bought her book tonight. Looking forward to tomorrow with Matt. Me too. And as far as the book and as far as everything going on here, you know, I... I I don't know, you know, like like I said, we've been living one way for a long time. We've We've taken what we think is good. We've thrown out what we think is bad. But the real question is... It's not about coming down hard on women. It's about, again, everybody's gotten it. Men, women, and children have had the balance of everything deliberately knocked off track by people whose goals have been very publicly stated. You got to do a little digging, but it's there in copious amounts. Copious amounts of information. Published writings about what what, what it all is. Now, ours is not... To discuss those writings, ours is not to look into the uh, the theosophical underpinnings of all this stuff. Ours is to talk about, you know, um, everybody's civil rights, everybody's this and that, and 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 lose track of the you know the both sides of a very interesting coin here, especially when it comes to the um, the rejection of the suffragette movement. That until tonight, many of you probably didn't even know that was a thing. And I'm glad she went into the very specific, some of the specific reasons as to why 
they didn't want it. But um, uh, there's there's more on this. I'm sure we'll do more. Over on Rumble, here are some Rumble rants. Boozer20 says, I don't get to catch the show live often. I thought I'd send some money since I was able to this time. Appreciate the work. I appreciate you, Boozer. And however you watch the show is fine by me. I'm just glad that the, the stream stayed up. It's 8.45. We're almost done with two hours. 925 Wild G says, uh, so Planned Parenthood plus Adrenochrome equals Femisatanism. Femisatanism. Yes, I, I guess I, I guess there's other, there's other, you can add a lot to that equation, I guess. Um, Gloria Steinem dripped, said Wild G. Witches rode flying wieners. Yes. Yes, I did not know that. Um, and has she been on with Tim Gordon? I think she has. In fact, Timothy Gordon was very excited to hear that, that she was calling in tonight. Let me put this over. She was very excited. He was very excited to learn that she was calling in tonight. Or he was very excited. Yeah. Um, he and Stephanie, his wife. And of course, she knows Jay Dyer. And I didn't know that she was on with uh, that, that Pearl um, girl. I've seen her around. She's gotten very popular recently, hasn't she? Uh, Valsky says, great guest tonight, Frank. Unrelated. This shirt is, uh, is not great. It is the exact replica of 1980s bowling team shirt by West Point. Sorry, Adel. Hey, listen. You do things for friends sometimes. I I don't I, I don't I don't mind this at all. I think it's very comfortable. I so said, you know what? It's comfortable. I don't care. And like I said, I said it before. I even saw that uh, super chat. It it looks like a bowling shirt. Didn't feel like you know. It's got a little bit of a collar, but the this the. This doesn't unbutton. There's no un there's no button to unbutton. But if it's nice and it feels good, so I'm sorry. Let's see. W let's see here. Wild G says possum. Wart guy says Aurora is in good hands. Great show again, Frank. Thank you. J Semo, excellent. Spud Hill says very enlightening show tonight. The guest is intelligent and interesting. Very, very, very. Not only has she written a lot and really uh, compiled a lot of information that I think is like startlingly uh, coherent and and put together, and she knows it so well. But she's a very good speaker. When I heard her on with Jay Dyer on the fourth hour of the Alex Jones show about a month ago, at this point, I said to myself, "Wow, I mean, the, I mean, the, the the conversation they had is great. If you want to go check that out, I'm sure it's on rerun on Band Video or something." But um, but I said um, her presentation was just so clear. So that was great. All right, over on Pilled.net, Foxhole, which powers, quite frankly, .tv. NJSF said, uh, sends a cookie. Robert Sorens, thank you. Uh, Brew, Bark, Brew Bark says, love your varied content, Frank. Thank you, Brew. Nao says, um, the mats... The mats will upload the full show for you if it cuts out like that. They've done it for me a lot. They rock. Oh, thank you, Neo. Thank you a lot. Uh, yes, well, I, I'll i talk to the mats about that. The, the problem is that if it cuts out on my end, how would Pilled or any place actually have anything to cut, to cut together? And the thing is that when you... Uh, I mean, if I were to... Oh, well, this is all technical stuff. We could talk about that some other time, but thank you, sir. Joe M. Paulie nine three six three says Christianity was the, was the uh, was the occult for three hundred years. The book is an idol. Paulie's been poking at uh, poking at that. You know this. The, he said that, and he was he was the other one. Oh, oh, he was the one that spoke. Seemed to be apologetically for um, Crowley the other day. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Maybe Paulie's throwing us for a loop there, but uh, I'm sure people will have at it over that one in the chat room. Uh, Sean Joe, thank you. Music Man, 73, th uh, 75, thank you. Rise Attire, I sent you that shirt, brother. Looks great on you. See, Rise Attire. I think it's great, man. And this is the design that, that Adel wanted. One way or another, I like the red. And it, listen, it's black and gold. He's from Pittsburgh. Of course it's going to be black and gold. But it feels good. 
and I like it. That interview was great, too. Very informative. Bring her back soon. Winston Dave says, Frank, as always, you're punching above your weight and doesn't you don't get the viewership you deserve. Awesome interview. Well, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, especially Winston Dave for saying that. There's things that we're going to be talking I'm going to be revealing in the next couple of weeks. That is just going to reaffirm my commitment to just creating a better quality and say, uh, you know, and when I say safer, I mean more secure going into tumultuous years ahead. A plan for this show. I think that viewership is just something that if we continue to do what we do and we keep it fun and varied like this and open and um, that's always going to, that's going to come along. Who knows, you know, every once in a while you catch a wave and you bring on a, a, a big group of people in, in an unexpected way. But as far as everything else goes, slow and steady wins the race. And you know what? If we have a couple more years of this show being, it, it's very large. It's very cozy. Um, what you're seeing in live viewership is, you know, when you add it all up, it's substantial. But it's not nearly as big as some other shows. That's fine. It's all Okay. It fits in your back pocket for now. We'll all remember these days. You remember when it fit in your back pocket? It'll always feel that way, even when it gets bigger. But I promise you, I'm uh, I'm always thinking about how to make it better show for those who are already here. And I believe that that approach will lead to meeting more friends along the way. Joe M says, I really did enjoy this one. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Sean Joe, who rounded it all out. Now, I am going to release the scratching on that one because it's uh, it's almost 9 o'clock. I don't know. if How am I going to read through uh, Nikola Tesla? Unless I make that part of tomorrow, tomorrow night's broadcast. Unless I make that a part of tomorrow night's broadcast with Matt, because I think he might think some of this is really interesting. But, um, but he is. I'm glad everybody liked it. Well, at least those who wrote in about liking it. Sure, there's other people ripping their hair out. Don't rip your hair out, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all right, 855. Let me give you just a little bit of this. Now, take a listen. Here is from. Uh, an engineer's aspect blogspot.com. I've had this for a couple of years now. This is from page 23, August 10th, 1924, of the Galveston Daily News, Galveston, Texas. Here's where it goes Mr. Tesla explains why he will never marry. When a man who has made a name for himself deliberately chooses to remain a bachelor, the world is naturally curious to know what the reasons were that impelled him to do to his choice. Uh, Marriage has come to be considered the natural thing for every normal man, and when some preeminent man shows a firm determination to sidestep it, everybody wonders whether his superior intelligence has revealed to him some fatal defects in the institution of matrimony which are not apparent to the average person. But the public's curiosity in this respect is seldom gratified. Most of the distinguished bachelors try to pass off their bachelorhood as a joke, saying that it is not a matter of choice, but because they have never been able to find a woman who would marry them. As a rule, they are singularly adverse to giving any serious reasons for their failure to become husbands. Nikola Tesla, the great scientist and inventor, is a striking exception to this rule. In a recent interview with a representative of this newspaper, he frankly explains why. He has never married and why he probably never will marry. And in connection with this explanation, he presents some ideas about women's freedom and what he thinks is sure to lead to what will be, uh, uh, what, what, will, uh, what will read with interest by those who agree with him, as well as many who will not. Now, remember, this is 1925. This is only a few years after the 19th Amendment has been passed. And we are uh, only, you know, we are in the infancy of women's liber- liberation. And listen to the foresight of some of this. I just got some uh, highlights over here. Women, says Mr. Tesla, are becoming stronger than men, both physically and mentally. The world has experienced many tragedies, but to my mind, the greatest tragedy of all is the present economic condition wherein women strive against men and in many cases actually succeed in usurping their places in the professions and in industry. 
This growing tendency of women to overshadow the masculine is a sign of deteriorating civilization. Women's determined, uh, co- uh, women's determined competition with men in the business world is breaking down some of the best traditions, things which have proved the moving factors in the world's slow but substantial progress. Practically all the great achievements of man un- until now have been inspired by his love and devotion to women, which is true. Uh, James Brown taught us all that. Man has aspired to great things because some women believed in him because he wished to command her admiration and respect. For these reasons, he has fought for her and risked his life and all for her time and time again. Perhaps the male in human society is useless. I am frank to admit, I don't know. If women are beginning to feel this way about it, and there's a striking evidence at hand that they do, then we are entering upon the cruelest period of our world's history. This is... I have to imagine that even to Rachel Wilson, this is pretty prophetic, and she already knows all the reasons why the the, the century to follow <laughs> from that point on really was the, uh, the the most damaging, as we talked about tonight. He continues, our civilization will sink to a state like uh, like that which is found among in the bees, the ants, and other insects, a state wherein the male is ruthlessly killed off. Wow. In this matriarchal empire, which will be established, the female rules. As the female predominates, the male are there at her mercy. The male is considered important only as a factor in the general scheme of the continuity of life. The tendency of women to push aside men, supplanting the old spirit of cooperation with him in all their affairs of life is very disappointing to me. Women's independence and her cleverness in obtaining what she wants in the business world is breaking down man's spirit of independence. The old fire he once experienced at being able to achieve something that would compel and hold a woman's devotion is turning to ashes. Women don't seem to want that sort of thing today. They appear to want control and to govern. They want man to look up to them instead of their looking up to him. He goes on, the, the, the author now goes on, in voicing his glooming views of modern life, Mr. Tesla says his observations are not confined to the women of this country. Conditions abroad, he said, suggest that the same tendency is worldwide. Having always regarded women as a super being, he expresses great sadness over the change he thinks the last few years have brought in her. Here's a quote, here are quotes from Nikola Tesla again, quote, I am considering this question not merely from the standpoint of man, he points out. I'm thinking of the woman's side of it. As we contemplate any change, we naturally take into consideration the results that may follow such uh, such an innovation. One of the results, to my mind, is quite a pathetic one. Woman herself, woman herself, is really the victim instead of, as she thinks, the victor. Contentment is absent from her life. She is ambitious, far from, uh, far, uh, often far beyond her natural equipment to attain the thing that she wants. She too frequently forgets that all women cannot be prima donnas and uh, motion picture stars. Now, this is motion picture stars. That's incredible right there. Now, it, I think it was Milton Friedman. Now I have to bring this up in a future show. I'm already thinking about, I have to introduce you Um, I have to introduce you to a friend of mine, Barbara Yates, and uh, she's a brilliant woman, wonderful person, and I got to spend some time with her at Jay Gulanello's health retreat. I got to bring her on as a guest, and that will be a little bit more of a practical daily thing, uh, and I want to just bring in economic uh, choices about empowering a person and being able to negotiate on your behalf and also have a uh, a little sprinkle of Milton Friedman in there. And I remember when Milton Friedman was breaking down the wage gap in this in a really concise, beautiful way that he always did about equal pay for equal work and all that and why it's all nonsense and you don't need the government to come in and and uh, and step in where the market really uh, works itself out on its own. He ended by telling the girl who was asking him, asking him whether or not he was really just against women and why he would he he want the workplace to be able to to hire men on top of, uh, you know, hire men instead of women just for prejudicial reasons. And he took that apart in really clean, compassionate kind of logic. And he cleans it off by saying, see, I'm on your side. You're not. And I think that is the biggest thing that 
the central planners have given to women who consider themselves feminists or whatever. They believe that they're fighting for themselves and they're fighting for their future. But it, when you really dig beyond all of the the Time magazine covers and the breathless news reporting about what's going on in the streets and the tide is turning and, and there's a counterculture out there and all that. When you really push beyond that, you see that it is, it is self-defeating. Self-defeating. And Nikola Tesla, here he is right here. There's a little bit more. He says, the power of the true woman is so great that I believe if a beautiful woman, that is, that a, that is to say one woman, uh, one beautiful in spirit, in manner, and in thought, in fact, beautiful in every respect, a sort of goddess, were to appear suddenly on earth, she could command the entire world. Her leadership, I believe, would be universally recognized. History has given us many examples of the wonderful influence exerted by unusual women. Among these have been the mothers of great men, but their influence lay not in their determination to outdo man or even compete with him. Perhaps because woman is a finer, more highly sensitized instrument, she knows by instinct her power and understands that the extent of it, the extent of it lies in the high position she takes for herself but the superior never descends to the level of the commonplace. I mean, this is one of the smartest men who ever walked the, the planet. I think it's really something else. I've had that, I've, I've read that a couple of times, or at least excerpts from it over the years. I think Rob was here for one of those nights that we did it years ago. I feel like it was around 2017 or so. Anyway, that's all I have for you tonight. Whatever you think, send me an email. Tell me how it's going for you, and I'll be on here tomorrow night by hook or by crook uh, with Matt, with Matt in tow for a Friday night on Quite Frankly. You ready for that? I am. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, and we will see you tomorrow. Be, be good, and be well. No! Perfection dashed at the last moment. All right. I'll catch you on the flip side. Quite frankly, is filmed before a live studio audience and now our super chatters. Starting with Northwest Grandma, the sentient now on Rockfin, all of my wonderful people on Pilled who are throwing, throwing their weight around like the wonderful people that they are. Thank you to Boozer, Boozer 20, 925 Wild G, Jay Semo, Wart Guy, uh, Spud Hill, and more. Tomorrow is another day. Thank you for tonight. Get on over to quitefrankly.tv and enjoy whatever the hell we have going on over there tonight. Goodbye. coronavirus we pray that it be dissolved with healing with healing with healing your cervix your penis your vagina your buttocks your colon go wash your hands <laughs>